So she says several things that dad is doing that she feels that her hands are tied. And she talks about her son's therapist who told her, you're going to have to just adjust your expectations. Hmm. She said, I have, but at what point do you stop adjusting? Yeah. Me, that's kind of her main question here. She's frustrated. It's been 18 months going through a divorce. A guardian ad litem is involved, which we all know just adds to the stress. There's more work involved. There's investigations going on. And so she's frustrated with letting go of things. Yes. (laughs) That's how I interpret the word adjusting. I'm adjusting. Yes. How much more do I have to adjust? Yes. So I'm asking the podcast people who keep telling me it's good to let go. When can I stop letting go? Yes. When can I hang on? Yes. (laughs) This is Diane Dirks. And I'm Rick Voiles. We've been working with co-parents in conflict for more than two decades. We've taught classes, written books, counseled parents, empathized, and even agonized occasionally to help people make sense of their complicated families. We were talking one day, and it occurred to us that helping the most difficult cases comes down to one simple concept. Is one parent willing to let go of the tug-of-war rope, or is it worth it to hold on and fight? So we invite you to take this journey with us each episode as we tackle the questions, should you hold on or let it go? Welcome to Co-Parent Dilemmas, where we give you practical solutions to those impossible co-parents. Good morning, Rick. Good morning, Diane. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. Yes. Yeah. What's good Uh... in your life? What is good? Well, we had a picnic on Memorial Day this weekend, Yay. so that was fun, and we yeah. got it in just before the rain. You can't have yeah. Memorial Day without rain, right? Oh, we didn't have any rain here, oh. although we went to a Memorial Day ceremony that evening in the park near the beach. It was really nice. So, nice. Yeah. That makes this week shorter, doesn't it? Oh, it does. I've already yeah. off track. I don't know what I day know. it is. <laughs> I don't either. So today, we have an email from Dina. Not sure where she's from. It's quite a long email, so I'm going to try to pare it down a little bit to get to her main points, but I'll read some of it and then I'll paraphrase some of it. It says, hello, Diane and Rick. First, I would like to start by saying thank you so much for this podcast. I've been listening every day for weeks and even re-listening to episodes when I feel I need the strength to get through a dilemma, Mm. which is a lot of times in my life right now. So first of all, thank you, Dina, for listening, and I'm glad you're getting something out of it. She goes on to say, I am currently going through a divorce 18 months now, which that hurts me to think she's been going through a divorce for that long. That's hard. Yeah. And I'm still not able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. A little bit of backstory. I left my soon-to-be ex after eight years of marriage due to his drinking. He's an alcoholic who is still in denial. We have a nine-year-old son, and he's witnessed this behavior and called me terrified because his father was so confused. After this incident, we were assigned a guardian ad litem who enabled Soberlink only when our son was with his father. And we're going to talk a little bit about Soberlink in a minute here. Yeah. It's a program that co-parents can use when they have a person who is prone to drinking. Then she goes on to say that my husband tests in front of our child and explained it to him as mommy is making me do this. She told on me. Mm. So dad is doing it in front of the child, but begrudgingly. And what we mean by doing it, when you have a sober link device, you blow into this device that tests whether or not you have alcohol in your system. And if you do, then you can't have the child for your appointed time. She goes on to say that he has encouraged their son to not FaceTime with her. And when he has FaceTime, the dad's always sitting right there next to the child they have been ordered to use a co-parenting counselor, but which her husband requested, but he won't engage in any of the exercises that the uh, counselor has given them. She thinks there's some alienating behaviors that the dad is engaging in and that the father is mad. It makes it known to our son that she left us, meaning that mom has left us. And we hear that a lot, don't we, Rick? That yes. Your dad 
had an affair on us. Mm -hmm. Your mom abandoned us when we know that to not be true, right? Right. (laughs) Parent had an affair on you. The spouse (laughs) didn't have an affair on the children, but that's how it gets played. So she says several things that dad is doing that she feels that her hands are tied. And she talks about her son's therapist who told her, you're going to have to just adjust your expectations. Hmm. She said, I have, but at what point do you stop adjusting? Yeah. Me, that's kind of her main question here. She's frustrated. It's been 18 months going through a divorce. A guardian ad litem is involved, which we all know just adds to the stress. There's more work involved. There's investigations going on, people that are being evaluated. And so she's frustrated with letting go of things. Yes. (laughs) That's how I interpret the word adjusting. I'm adjusting. Yes. How much more do I have to adjust? Yes. So I'm asking the podcast people who keep telling me it's good to let go that (laughs) when do I, when can I stop letting go? Yes. When can I hang on? Yes. Yes. Um, And she ends her email with this caveat. And I think this is very important. My parents are divorced and it was a lot of bashing and name calling. And I swore I would never do that to my child. So to watch his father do it to our son breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. And and I do sympathize with that. that She's been through this as a child of divorce herself. Now she's having to relive that and watch the pain in her own son. So I don't get from this that the son is blaming her. There's some resistance on the son toward mom. It sounds like we have a polarized child here. Yes. Yeah, a nine-year-old. Kind of stuck. There was another part of the email. I think she referred to the son as feeling sorry for the dad. Yeah. Kind of dad is parentifying the child. Mm Mm-hmm causing the child to feel sorry for the parent and wanting to take care of dad's feelings. The good news, and I'm assuming, Dina, the only way you know that dad is saying these things, you haven't heard him yourself, but your son is, your nine-year-old is coming home and telling you. Yeah. Which is very, very important. Yes. That he feels comfortable enough to say, dad's blaming you. (laughs) You Right. Dad says, this is all your fault. Dad says you're making me blow into this device. Dad says you told on him. Dad. Uh-huh. So as we have talked many times before, how she responds to the child telling her these things is vitally, vitally important. The most important. Yeah. Yes. So what are your thoughts, Rick? On this? Well, I want to paint a little bit of a picture about this nine-year-old. I mean, we're probably in a parent-pleaser developmental stage trying to make both parents okay. And the child feels that pull. So the dilemma is I want to empathize with my dad who's telling me one thing and seems to be in some kind of pain and I want to help. And then at the other hand, I come home and I have a different experience than what I'm being told my mom is. Mm -hmm. And this child is basically, I mean, I could see this child trying to figure out which reality do I hang on to because they're both contradictory. I can't hold on to both at the same time, which means when your child comes to you and says, dad says it's your fault, but dad mm-hmm. says you left us, the child isn't asking for the truth. Defend yourself, mom. Yes. They're asking, mom, can you help me manage this tension that I have between two realities? Right. And can you even understand how hard this is? Oh, yes. Right. You know? right. So I think it's important that the mom can respond to the child based on what the child knows. And this is the part that we often don't get the in-between story on these emails, right? So all we can do is make assumptions. We're not sure if the child has witnessed dad in his drunken state. Has mom and dad gotten into fights before and dad's stumbling around and the child knows Yeah. Dad drinks. And when he does, things get bad. 
or is dad the kind of alcoholic who is very good at hiding mm. it from the child and the child may not be aware. And I think that's important. So even when you have to talk to children about what's happening, we don't want to pretend like what they're seeing isn't happening. Sometimes we can protect them so much from the truth because yeah. we don't want them to be in the middle. We can also discount or kind of insult them when we say, oh, everything's fine. Right. Your yeah. daddy loves you. And they're right. like, what? Yes. Even when he fell down the stairs last week and you guys got into it, I should just pretend like that didn't happen. Those are the secrets of the alcoholic home we don't want to perpetuate. Exactly. Okay. So that's an issue here. If you suspect the child has seen dad's alcoholic behavior, it has affected the marriage negatively, and the child has somewhat been in the middle of that or witnessed that, I think it's okay to talk frankly to the child. I'm sorry that your dad has told you that or blaming me for that. He's just hurt right now, but you also witnessed some of the difficulties that we've experienced and so mommy decided it was better for us to live apart than to live in the same house. Mm -hmm. You're kind of validating this has not been easy for you either. Yeah. And this was a really hard decision because there's no perfect decision here. No. But I felt like that conflict was not good for you and or me. And yes, I did decide to leave the marriage, but I will never decide to leave you. That's a whole different thing. So I had to make this really hard decision. And you always want to say to the child to give them hope. I hope your dad gets better. Mm -hmm. I really hope that he works on this issue that he has with the drinking that you've witnessed, that kind of thing. So that's a different conversation than a child who was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never seen daddy take a drink. He mm. drinks a beer now. And then oftentimes kids will defend their alcoholic parents behavior because they really don't have any experience other than the occasional beer and the party that you might have at the house or where all the adults seem to be drinking, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if that's the case, doesn't do you any good to try to prove to your child that what he thinks is wrong. So if your child is defending the other parent's behavior and I don't think he has a problem, okay. Yeah. That, that's fine too. I still don't want you in the middle of this. Right. So be mindful of that because nine years old, it's a pretty tender age. Yes. If he was 14. We would be having different conversations. He would very much probably be aware mm -hmm. of some things, but at nine Depending on the maturity of the child and what he's seen, use that also as wisdom to decide how much to say or what to talk about with the child. But ultimately, I think we've talked about this many times, Rick, whatever you say, you want to assure that child that no matter what happens, we're going to be okay. Yes. <laughs> well, before we get into the other details, I want to talk a little bit about Soberlink. This episode is brought to you by Soberlink. Did you know that approximately 10% of children live with a parent who has an alcohol use disorder? That's a staggering amount of children whose safety may be in jeopardy during their parenting time. If you're divorced or considering a divorce, it's important to be prepared for any case scenario, including co-parenting with a spouse who might have an alcohol problem. There's so many unique tools on the market that are designed to be there when you can't, and the one I have seen clients use most successfully is Soberlink. It improves child safety while helping parents and children maintain relationships, and it provides peace of mind during custodial time. However, if a parent is drinking during parenting time, Soberlink sends real-time results, allowing for swift intervention. The system's results are court admissible, but more importantly, it keeps the focus on the best interests of the child. To learn more about Soberlink and receive $50 off your device, visit Soberlink.com dilemmas. That's S-O-B-E-R-L-I-N-K dot com slash dilemmas. Thank you, Soberlink, because we told them we had this specific question that included them. And so they thought, yeah, we'll sponsor that. So Soberlink is something that can be put into your court order when there has been a history of alcohol abuse. Why would you want to use a service like Soberlink? because you want some peace of mind, right? Oh, yes. Because and, your child's going to be over there, right? Right. Yeah. So you know that if you worry about it and all parents who have left a parent because of their drinking, 
knows very well, okay, I got myself out of it. Now I'm kind of leaving my kids in it. Correct. And that's a lot of the reason why a lot of parents don't leave. Yes. Uh, because they don't want to leave their kids in danger. So this allows the parent to be prepared for those situations where you don't want to count on your child to be the monitor. No. Daddy looks drunk. Don't get in the car. You know, Uh huh. you don't want them to have to be that responsible. And so that allows you to be able to be prepared for anything that might come up. So there's a lot of conversation about how do you talk to your kids about that? Mm-hmm. Why is daddy or mommy blowing into this device? And so again, you want to be kind about that. You don't want to say, well, because your mom's a, you know, but a <laughs> careful drunk <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and she's got to do this because she's been a bad, bad mom. No, this is just for our protection. Yep. So talking sensitively to the child about it is really important. I think not the way the dad is doing it in this particular scenario. Dad is saying, your mom told on me and now right. the court is making me do this. Mommy's making me do this. Yeah, yeah, I don't think, and let's just say it from this perspective, and I don't know this couple and I don't know this family. It would be rare for a court to make you do this if they didn't find enough evidence that it would yeah. be in the best interest of the child to do it. <laughs> well, and, and if there's really not a problem, then why are you worried about it? It will prove that there's not a problem. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so. Yeah. I don't buy that argument that it's all because of your mom, that the, she had so much power over the court, right? <laughs> <laughs> if she could do that, things would have <laughs> yeah. changed a lot earlier. Exactly. Exactly. So I think it's important and we're going to have some information on our show notes about Soberlink so that if you do have this situation and it's important to you, and we hope that you'll take advantage of those services. So I also want to then discuss her question regarding when do you stop adjusting? Now we have a child's therapist yeah. who is telling the mom, there's some things here you're just going to have to accept. What do you think the therapist was trying to tell the mom? We'll be back after a quick break. Hey, everyone. This is Chris from the Financial Philosophers Podcast, and I'd like to invite you to come check out our show. We explore the nuances of personal finance on topics that are both simple and complex. Rather than regurgitating the same financial rules of thumb you've heard over and over again, we do a deep dive with real-life examples about compelling and relatable financial topics. I guarantee you will walk away with something new you didn't know before. Come nerd out with us, and let's take this financial journey together. Yeah, I would think if I was saying this, you needed to adjust. I would say you need to really lower your expectations regarding dad. Yes. What you think dad might do or might not do or can do or cannot do. Let's leave that behind because that's a waste of energy and time because you don't have control over that. Right. Even if, and just take it to the extreme, even if the court were to say, this is so bad that this dad should not have time with his child, that would not be an easier scenario for you, mom. Right. Because that probably isn't what your son wants. It sounds like your son, if he's empathizing with dad, he loves his dad. Sure. He wants a relationship with him. So the answer isn't, how do I make this go away? No. And the answer is also not, how do I make dad better? No, 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 no. The answer is, how do I help my child through this with the least amount of stress possible? Yes. And that's always within mom's control. It's right. just a matter of learning some new behaviors, learning some mm-hmm. new communication skills. She doesn't like it because she's being forced to let go of some things like the phone calls. She said the child is being encouraged to not FaceTime with her. Okay. She's had to let that go. And that's yes. frustrating for her. Mm-hmm. Now there's this co-parent counseling thing she's going through and Dad's not participating the way the therapist wants him to. And that's frustrating. And she sounds like she's having to sort of let that go. Okay, well, that's not working. He's not listening to that professional either. Right. And so there are some things that aren't working that she is upset about. But I want to remind you, Dina, that you left the relationship, which is a big deal. Most of us don't leave relationships 
willy nilly. We don't think about it for three hours and then leave it. We think about it for years. Yes. A lot of times I'm sure this was a very hard decision. It was so hard for you that you had to probably think about your child regarding it for a long time. Which is probably one of the biggest motivations for following through on the decision was her child. Yes. So you did that, which means you decided in the marriage, this couldn't be helped. So we always say, don't expect in divorce what you didn't get in marriage. Right. It makes sense then that he's not necessarily going to have an aha moment because you bring in a co-parent counselor. No. <laughs> or even the, if the child's therapist says to dad, you know, you really need to control this because or you really need to be a better co-parent or you really need to stop saying these things to your child. This isn't about getting dad to do the right thing or making sure I like that the guardian has sober link involved. So at least that gives you some peace of mind and some assurance that when your child is with him, at least he's not under the influence of alcohol. But beyond that, there's no way to control what he's saying to your child or any of that. So it really is about how you're speaking to your child. So give up this. At what point can I stop adjusting? There won't be a point. No. You adjust, 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 <laughs> as long as your child is being affected. That's you, just what we do. As you, yes. You, uh, you stop adjusting the day after you've mastered parenting. Which is when they're like 18. <laughs> <laughs> they're 27, probably. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yes. So I want to turn the conversation a little bit now that we've said all of that to this. Dina, you said you went through this as a child and how hard it was. I want you to spend some time thinking and maybe even talking with a therapist on your own. What do you wish one of your parents would have said to you that would have made it better for you? That's good. Would it have been helpful if your mother would have approached you and said, man, I know exactly how you feel because I was there as a child or I see in your face how hard this is. Did you want an apology? Did you want some assurances that no matter what, everything's going to be okay? Did you want one parent to just decide to not engage? And think about what you wish you could have gotten, maybe even what you wish you still could get. I don't know. Mm. Just because you're an adult doesn't mean your parents aren't still fighting. By bashing and each you other. Yes. aren't still stuck in the middle, right? Right. But let that guide you to what you should say to your child. Mm. Um, if And we use this exercise in one of our classes. 10 years from now, when your son is 19, what do you want him to say about you that you did? Not what dad did, but what you did that made all of this easier. Mm -hmm. If you were to overhear him telling one of his 19-year-old friends yeah, went through a divorce. That sucked. It was awful. But thank God for my mom, because she always did blank. Or she said this to me at one point and that made it all better. Fantasize about that moment and then do now what it is that you think will make that difference. And if you start thinking along those lines, none of this other stuff about how long do I give in? <laughs> What do I do about him? He's impossible. We know. Yes. We're trying to teach you how to be the non-impossible parent, right. right? And these are the the attributes of the non-impossible parent that you focus more of your attention on. If I were my child, what would I want to hear mm. from my mom or my dad? And then you be that so that you can build resiliency in your child, build strength and then build character. Yes. Does that make that makes sense, Rick. It does. And I think her last line about going through this with her yeah. parents, and she swore that she would never do this to her child. Yeah. I want to point out that this is a concern about legacy. And yes. she's already stopped that. The fact yeah. that she went through it and both parents were doing it by asking this question, by listening to this podcast, she's not passing this forward on to her son because she's not going to do it. Yes. Great point. I love that. You're exactly right. All right. Well, thank you, Dina, for your question. And 
I hope that that helps a little bit. Good well, job, Dina. Yeah. And uh, we will talk to you all next week. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Hey, listeners, how would you like to become a non-impossible VIP? Well, it's easy. Just go to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash CP Dilemmas. And Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash CP Dilemmas. You'll get a special invite to our monthly live Q&As with Rick and me, where you will have the opportunity to ask questions and get real-time advice. You'll also receive non-impossible merchandise credits through our Facebook page, as well as my book, The Co-Parent Toolbox, in an ebook version. If you're a professional who works with co-parents, becoming a VIP means a monthly mention on our show. So all of this is for only $10 a month. So get connected more personally through Patreon. Thanks for listening. If you received something valuable out of this episode, please let us know. That really helps us to know what's important to you. Or if you have a question about your co-parent dilemma, please call our voicemail number at one two three four dilemma You can also email us at 1234dilemma at gmail.com. Or better yet, access us on our listener Facebook page where we engage in lots of discussion about what we say on these episodes. Just search Facebook for non-impossibles. No matter how you communicate with us, if you don't feel comfortable using your real name, just let us know. We understand. The information contained in this podcast is generic. It must not be misconstrued as constituting legal or psychological advice. Decisions relevant to any specific individual, family system, or case require the direct evaluation of skilled, child-centered professionals. 